Hello, today I'm going to have a close look at Da Vieux Jardin by the French composer Lily Boulanger. Twenty eighteen is the centenary year of the death of Lily Boulanger, who passed away on March fifteenth, nineteen eighteen. I wanted to mark this centenary with an analysis of one of her pieces. Lily Boulanger is a very significant French composer from the beginning of the twentieth century, and if you understand her music, then you will have understood a very important aesthetic from early twentieth century. Music. It's music that is very fascinating and intriguing from an aesthetic point of view, and also from a historical point of view. So, a lot of her most characteristic pieces were written either at the outset or towards the end of the First World War. So, really, her most productive phase falls between the years of 1913 and 1918. So, this music is really a fascinating snapshot of a historical moment. So, it's it's music that is both historically and aesthetically poised on the brink of the destruction both of the European continent, but also of traditional tonality. So Lily Boulanger goes actually quite far in terms of harmonic experimentation in a lot of her music, and the piece that I'm going to look at, Dans Vieux Jardin, for solo piano, is a good example of that. Lily Boulanger was born in Paris in 1893, which turns out to actually be quite significant in terms of her historical position. She was born at a time when French art, so literature, music, painting, was enjoying international prominence, and at a time when French artists were dismantling the old received notions of art and creating entirely new approaches, many of which would be extremely influential throughout the entire 20th century. So you had poets such as Stéphane Mallarmé, you had the Impressionists, you have composers such as Claude Debussy and Maurice Ravel, and many, many others, all contributing to a uniquely significant cultural moment that really belonged to France. And Boulanger was also quite lucky in the sense of being born into a family of prominent musicians. So her father, Ernest Boulanger, had won the Prix de Rome in 1835, so I'll talk a little bit more about what that is exactly a little bit later on. And her sister, Nadia Boulanger, would go on to be arguably the most important composition professor of the entire 20th century. So Nadia Boulanger taught generation upon generation of very significant composers, many of whom came from the United States, and she certainly left a very strong aesthetic mark on the music of the 20th century. As for Lily Boulanger, she was precociously talented, so from a very, very early age, she was a gifted pianist. She was able to master the techniques and tools of traditional composition at blistering speed, but perhaps even more remarkably, she did so despite the fact that she suffered intensely throughout her short life from a variety of illnesses. So we know now that what she suffered from was an autoimmune disorder, and it killed her by the age of 24. So she would have periods of relatively good health interspersed with bouts of severe illness. So when she was in remission, she was able to compose, and when she was ill, it was very, very difficult for her to do anything. So she was constantly being taken around to various spas throughout Europe by her mother and subjected to varying treatments, and unfortunately none of these really worked out, and in the long run she was not able to recover her health. So one of the more amazing facts about the biography of Lily Boulanger is that she was the first woman to win the Prix de Rome in 130 years, so in the entire history of the existence of that prize. So I need to say a few words about what the Prix de Rome is exactly. So the Institut de France every year would select a young French composer to go live in Rome for several years at the Villa Medici, usually for two or three years. In addition to winning this prize, which obviously was extremely prestigious and sought after, you would be given commissions, you would be given a publishing contract, you would have performances, and you would really be instantly catapulted into a very high social rank in French artistic circles. So it's interesting when you look back actually over the list of people who have won the Prix de Rome that very, very few of them are actually still remembered. So Lily Boulanger is among the very small handful of recipients of this prize to have achieved international recognition and to sort of have remained in the repertoire. However, I think that her music still should be even better known than it is. It's absolutely remarkable music and it's a sort of fascinating corner of music history. So it's very easy and tempting to say, well, if only she had lived longer, think of what she might have done. And I can certainly understand that point of view. Any composer who dies at the age of 24, well, that's obviously a life that's been cut short. Nevertheless, we need to focus on what she actually accomplished. So she left behind 
about 50 completed works, many of which are sublimely beautiful. And I'd like to look at one piece in particular that I think is quite characteristic, but that is also conveniently rather short. So it allows me to look at some of the defining characteristics of her music in the span of a two to three minute work. So Lily Boulanger composed a number of very important key works that I would certainly encourage everyone to listen to. Among them are the cantata that won her the Prix de Rome in 1913. So incidentally, in order to win this prize, this is something to think about. You had to write an entire original cantata based on a text and on a theme that would be provided by the Institute. So that's quite an amazing thing. You'd have 30 days to write an entire piece and orchestrate it just from a purely physical point of view, from the point of view of concentration, of having to invent that much music in such a short time. You had to be very, very technically strong and very self-assured in order to produce anything that would be half worthwhile. And Lily Boulanger not only did so brilliantly, but she wrote a very beautiful piece, a cantata called Faust et Hélène, which has been recorded a few times, and I would definitely encourage everyone to listen to this piece. It's very, very beautiful. She had a, a very solid grasp of dramatics, of theatricality, that comes across beautifully in this piece. I would also certainly recommend listening to her three psalm settings. So these are works of varying duration for combinations of soloists, choruses and orchestra, and again, they, they show a very, very steady hand, an absolute mastery of compositional technique, and a beautiful dramatic flair as well. So there's also a piece called Pia Jesu, which is written to a fragment of the Requiem text, and we don't really know if she was intending to set an entire Requiem at the end of her life, but in any case, if that was the project, this is the only movement that survives. On her deathbed, she somehow managed, despite her terrible physical weakness and intense physical pain, to dictate this piece to her sister Nadia. So it's an absolutely hauntingly beautiful piece, full of chromaticism, very, very, very strange, but absolutely worth listening to. So that's just a very short, about just over four minute long piece. I also have to mention the later orchestral pieces. She wrote a, a series of orchestral works that are absolutely sumptuously scored, very beautiful. There's one in particular that I quite like called De Matin de Printemps. So those are some key works, but again, it's, it's definitely worthwhile exploring her work list, generally speaking, because there's a lot of very beautiful music. I actually think that Lily Boulanger is at her best and at her most characteristic in some of the shorter works, which is another reason why I wanted to concentrate on this particular piano piece. So I'm going to look at the first of the Trois Morceaux pour Piano. So the Trois Morceaux is a collection of three pieces for piano. Now, I'm not actually sure if that collection of pieces was cobbled together by a publisher posthumously or if she intended them to be grouped together as a set, but they're really quite disparate works. The main thing that you can say in terms of how they actually fit together is that they're a collection of contrasting character pieces. Really, it's the first one that I find the most intriguing, Dans Vieux Jardin, which translates as From an Old Garden. The other pieces in the set are Dans le Jardin Clair, from a light or clear garden, and Cortège, which means procession. So this is really quite intriguing music, like a lot of the things that were being written around this time. It's music that seems to look backwards and forwards simultaneously. So this was written at almost the exact same time as the Drei Kleine Stücke of Anton Webern for cello and piano, and also the three pieces for string quartet, the Trois Pièces pour Quatuor Accord by Igor Stravinsky, which I've also analyzed on this channel. So both of those pieces take basically classical forms and more or less explode them and, and also try out some very radical new techniques. And that's more or less what's happening in this piece as well. You have a vague outline of a traditional ABA type of form, but you have these very exploratory, very unusual harmonies. A lot of people have actually commented on this piece and said that it sounds jazz-like, but I think it would actually be more accurate to say that jazz sounds Lily Boulanger-like because actually, well, first of all, she preceded the language of jazz by quite a number of decades. And secondly, pianists such as Bill Evans, who worked with Miles Davis in the 1950s, were actually borrowing from the language of so-called French Impressionism, so composers like Claude Debussy. And a lot of the harmonies that you see in a piece like this are basically of the same nature. So the sort of extended 9th, 11th, and even 13th chords and various inversions that you would get in a lot of the more harmonically audacious jazz come directly from French music from the beginning of the 20th century. So I mentioned that Dans Vieux Jardin has basically a tripartite form, an ABA form. So what does that mean exactly? Well, an ABA form is also known as a lead form. So a lead is a German word simply meaning song. So a lot of 19th century vocal music is written in this sort of a formal scheme. So what you get basically in an ABA form is an initial section of a piece that establishes an atmosphere, 
Then you have a contrasting middle section. And in the contrasting middle section, usually you have a very different expressive atmosphere. You have often a, a change of tonality or a change of mode. You might pass from major to minor or vice versa. You have a change in terms of the tempo, in terms of the dynamics. So you'll, you'll have a very thoroughgoing contrast between A and B. And then at the end of the piece, you restate A. Now, it might be a literal restatement, or it might be a varied or developed restatement. But generally speaking, you have this very well-rounded form in which you have an initial statement, a contrasting statement, and a return to the initial state affairs at the end of the piece. So that's more or less what happens here. But interestingly, the contrast between A and B is rather attenuated in this particular piece. So as you're listening to the work, you don't have a particular sense of the sectionality of it. What you really hear is a continual flow of musical ideas. And in this sense, I think Nidhi Boulanger is somewhat close, actually, to, to Robert Schumann, and especially to his shorter chamber works, pieces like the Romances, for example, for oboe and piano which operate in a similar manner formally in the sense that you do have a contrast in the middle section, but it's a contrast that doesn't particularly draw attention to itself because there's just this continual evolution of musical ideas. However, one major distinction between Schumann and Boulanger is that whereas Schumann typically works with very short cells or motifs that are developed throughout the course of the entire piece, in this work, we don't really have a great deal of what you might call motifs or thematic workings. Really, this is a piece that consists largely of harmonic textures. So I'm going to analyze that section by section. We're going to go through the whole piece and I'll provide a harmonic breakdown so you can see exactly how the work functions. So we do have one motivic element in this piece. It's very, very short, actually. It just consists of five notes. It starts on a D sharp and then proceeds downwards to a low A. So one of the first things that you notice about this particular motif is that it spans a tritone. So that's obviously a dissonant interval, and it's not one that you would typically find in a classical motif. That's the first thing you can say about it. The second thing is that it certainly brings to mind the opening of the Prélude à l'après-midi d'un faune, the Prélude to the Afternoon of a Faun of Claude Debussy, which starts on a C-sharp and then proceeds downwards chromatically to a low G, and then back up again. So there is a, a slight thematic motivic similarity to that piece, although the music itself couldn't be more different. The other thing I'd like to say about this descending motif is that the first two notes of the motif, the D-sharp, C-sharp, return throughout the piece as a kind of leitmotif, and each time they return, they, they vaguely call to mind the piece's beginning without necessarily explicitly entailing a reprise of the entire theme. So this motif is actually never heard precisely the same way twice, although the general shape of it, and certainly the pitches D-sharp and C-sharp, do return throughout the work. So the piece is ostensibly in C-sharp minor, and that's how it starts and that's how it ends, and there are several points during which the piece returns to that tonality, but only very, very briefly. And at no point can you really say that a, a key of C-sharp minor is particularly affirmed, although perhaps you could make that argument with regards to the coda at the end of the piece. But other than that, it's, it's harmonically absolutely all over the map. So the, the harmony is fluid and mobile throughout. So although the first chord you hear is a C-sharp minor chord, the impact of this chord is weakened by the fact that the first pitch you hear is a D sharp. So you hear this D sharp against the C sharp minor chord, which acts as an appoggiatura. So we start with a dissonant note, which is very, very briefly resolved before the music immediately veers off into an entirely different harmonic direction. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll just play the opening section of the work, the, the A section, and we can have a listen to that, and then I'll comment on the way it's structured harmonically. Okay, so one of the things you might have noticed after listening to the first section of the piece is that the harmonic progressions that it contains are only vaguely functional. In other words, you don't really have a tonic dominant opposition in this music. And that's something that really sets it apart from classical music, generally speaking, where throughout the entire classical period, and indeed throughout a lot of the Romantic period, you typically have a very strong opposition between two harmonic zones. 
And so a great deal of the dramaturgy of a classical piece usually consists of starting out in place A, ending up in place B, which creates a tension and it creates a nostalgia and it creates a desire for resolution. And then at the end, you work back towards your point of departure. However, in this piece, although we start in C-sharp minor, we leave it immediately and we go all over the place. And none of the harmonic progressions are particularly easily relatable to any of the scale degrees of C-sharp minor. It's music that proceeds through juxtapositions of chords that aren't particularly related to each other in terms of a traditional harmonic framework. The other thing is that a lot of the harmonic progressions are basically parallel chords, so that gives it a kind of organum-like quality. Organum being a principle of melodic writing that dates back to medieval music, in which you have various vocal lines that move in parallel to each other. So a lot of these parallel chords are connected through stepwise sequences. So it'll go up a semitone each time, or it'll go up a tone each time, or you might have a sequence of thirds or of fourths and so on and so forth. So there are principles according to which these chords are connected to each other, but they're not particularly related to traditional tonal principles. So while the music uses triadic sonorities and extensions of triadic sonorities, it doesn't really function according to traditional harmonic procedures. You might also have noticed that despite the extremely fluid and dreamlike nature of the music, it does have basically a classical phrase structure, or at least the, the A section does. So by classical phrase structure, I mean that we have basically a phrase in two sections. So we have a first half of the phrase that comes to a, a rest after a certain point, and that basically functionally sounds like a half cadence. Now this is not exactly a literal half cadence, but that's more or less what it sounds like in terms of the direction of the music. And then halfway through, it's not quite complete. You don't have a sense that the phrase is over. It comes to a pause, we start again, and then we end up where we started again at the end. So it starts in C sharp minor and it ends in C sharp minor with a pause, a cadence ending on F major in between. So I mentioned at the outset that the contrast between sections A and B is somewhat weak in this piece. However, there certainly are contrasting elements. So the first is that whereas the first section was at least nominally in C sharp minor, the second section seems to stay mostly in a major mode throughout the work. So that's a first contrast. It, it contrasts modally. The second is that it's meant to be played slightly faster, and indeed it's rather more animated than the first section. But there are other things that are going on in this section that distinguish it from A. So one of them is harmonic. So you'll notice that we start to get parallel sevenths and ninth chords present in the, in the piece in this section in sequence. So I've got three of these sequences laid out here. So you can see in my harmonic outline here at the bottom of the screen that I've, I've indicated the roots of each chord in red so that they're just a little bit easier to read. And you'll see here that in this dominant seventh sequence, we have a series of seventh chords, so a G seventh chord, an A seventh chord, a D seventh chord, and an E flat seventh chord. And then we have a, a, another sequence after that of, of parallel seventh chords, and incidentally these are all heard in, in various inversions, so in this case these seventh chords are heard in third inversion, and they go G, A, and B. So it's a, it's a stepwise ascending sequence of parallel seventh chords. Next we have a dominant ninth sequence, and again you can see the, the roots of the chords here in red, so D, B flat, F flat, and A. So again, a very, very unusual juxtaposition of chords and almost impossible to relate to a traditional harmonic scheme. So this B section oscillates, generally speaking, between A major and F major without really settling on, on one or the other. So it's music that is extraordinarily fluid harmonically. It never really seems to want to settle down into any one particular place. The point is to have a continually changing series of textures and moods. So the other thing I'd like to say about this piece, and about this section in particular, is that the chord spacings are very, very wide. So in, in one sense, it's not particularly idiomatically written for the piano. Some of the chord spacings, in fact, are so wide that they are actually literally impossible to play as written. You have to actually roll the chords in order to play them.
One other feature of the B section is that it uses the whole tone scale rather prominently. So the whole tone scale is a scale that, as its name indicates, consists only of whole tones. So in other words, if you were to start on C natural, you would have C natural, D natural, E natural, F sharp, G sharp, a sharp and then the sequence would continue. And one of the interesting things about this whole tone scale is that it doesn't actually contain a tonic dominant relationship. What it contains is a tonic tritone relationship since the first four pitches of the scale are C, D, E, F sharp. So that makes it actually very interesting harmonically and it also opens up the door to all sorts of harmonic experimentation that composers like Debussy and certainly Lili Boulanger freely indulged in around this period. So there's an example of the whole tone scale in this piece, starting on G sharp and descending downwards. So now I'd like to talk about the reprise of A. So the initial A section, remember, was written in two halves, according to the scheme of a classical theme. The other thing is the section ended with a brief sequence. So just to remind you, here's the sequence that you hear at the end of the A section, which basically functions as a transition between A and B. Okay, so in the reprise of A, we have these same materials, except they appear in reverse order. So in other words, we hear first the transition or sequence material, and then we hear the material that is proper to the A section itself, with notably the return of the initial motif that we heard at the outset of the piece. But in keeping with the overall aesthetic of this music, the return of the initial motif is a varied return. Again, nothing really appears literally twice in exactly the same manner in this music. So as with the first section of the piece, the return of A makes passing reference to C-sharp minor, although it's very, very fleeting, and it's not until the very end of the work, during the coda section of the piece, that we have anything that might resemble an extended passage on C-sharp minor. Also in keeping with the rest of the piece, we do have these sequences of parallel chords, and in this particular section, we have a particularly lengthy descending sequence. So the other thing I'd like to say about this piece, generally speaking, is that a great deal of the harmonic and the melodic movement is downwards. So you'll have these, these downwards sequences of chords, and then in order to be able to start again and to sort of relaunch the music at a certain point, you'll have brief little ascending sequences, but those ascending sequences are, are rather fleeting in comparison to the descending ones which tend to dominate. So that does give the music a somewhat tragic and melancholic character, generally speaking. So in this section in particular, we have a, a very lengthy descending sequence. And you'll notice here that, I've, again, I've, I've got the, the roots of the chords in red, so you can very clearly see how the progression moves. And you'll notice that, with a couple of exceptions, the music generally proceeds downwards by thirds. So it's basically a cycle of downwards thirds. So some of the chords are seventh chords, some of them are dominant ninth chords, and they're connected to each other in a very unusual way throughout. So the music is like a perpetual descending staircase in an interesting sense. You don't particularly notice when it's rising temporarily in order to start the descent again, but that is basically the dominant impression that the music gives. And true to form, the very end of the piece, the coda, which I'm going to play, has a continual descending chromatic sequence. So this sequence descends downwards, a full octave from an E down to the E an octave lower. So the bass line proceeds downwards by half steps, and we have a series of chords played in the right hand that go along with them. So I'm going to play this coda section now, and you can see how the piece ends. So this is a very beautiful work, and I would just like to encourage everybody in the centenary year of Lady Boulanger to listen to as many of her pieces as you can manage. There's plenty of things on YouTube. I'm going to provide some links at the bottom of this video so that you can listen to some of her works. Start with the Pia Jesu, an absolutely haunting late piece. Listen also to the orchestral works. There's just so much beautiful music from this wonderful composer. It's music that richly rewards multiple hearings. If you like this channel, 
support it. Your help allows me to keep on making high quality music education videos available to anyone who wants to watch them around the world at any time for free. Check out the rewards for varying levels of support at www.patreon.com slash Samuel Andreev. You can also follow me on Twitter at Samuel Andreev and visit my website at www.samuelandreev.com. Thanks for watching.